It is a myth that there was some golden age of education. Once upon a time when everything was just great and then the unions came along and made things complicated by giving teachers a voice. When you look at the past, public education wasn't equal for all races. There was enormous overcrowding with more than 60 students in a classroom. I mean, teachers were paid the same as people who were washing cars for a living. I think in the long run, the children will benefit from our efforts, and I certainly think that education in New York City will take a great leap forward. Because of collective bargaining, you now have teachers get better salaries. They start to get smaller class size. Challenging administrators to give teachers more power over their own working conditions. Bringing public education onto the national agenda. The teachers unions are the reason that we have a system of public education in this country. AFT has always fought for professional dignity and economic security. That school staff have the tools and conditions to do their jobs, healthcare workers can provide safe patient care, professors have academic freedom, and government workers can advocate for the services they provide. And through this, AFT has been and continues to be an essential part of making the United States more just, more equal, with more opportunity for all. Margaret Haley started teaching at the age of 16, came to Chicago 1882. Her life sort of typified what it was like to be a teacher at the time in Chicago. The teaching profession was overwhelmingly something like 85% women. And she taught in Packingtown in the Stockyards District, where she worked with the poorest of the poor, immigrant children, most of whom did not go beyond sixth grade. Some of them didn't speak English. Classes were overcrowded. The only difference between a prison cell and a Chicago classroom in many cases was uh, blackboard. While teachers are working in these poor conditions for low pay, they also start losing classroom autonomy in the late 1890s, when the school board becomes centralized and politicized and they start to determine teachers' transfer policy, curriculum, testing, all of those elements of teachers' working conditions. Margaret Haley was very bothered by the fact that outsiders were telling teachers what to do. And this leads specifically into why she helps to found the Chicago Teachers Federation. The teachers found out that they were not going to get the $50 a year pay increase that they had been promised by the school board. The major issue was that the corporations were avoiding paying taxes insider shenanigans between local officials and businesses. And Margaret Haley and the teachers in Chicago spend the next three to four years levying a lawsuit. And this is an incredible story because this is a woman who has a little more than an elementary school education. She learns law, she learns corporate finance, she battles her way into some of these city and state offices. She has this great strategy of kind of playing dumb, and she'll say, oh, I, I just walked into this room kind of by mistake. And oftentimes those men officials, not thinking she was anyone significant, would give her information. They didn't know who they were giving it to. And so the judges basically came down in favor of the Chicago Teachers Federation. But they don't win much money in the end. It's sort of a Pyrrhic victory. But what they do win is a lot of publicity. The tax case becomes this cause celebre across the country, and she goes on a lot of speaking tours to promote public education, and particularly the responsibility of corporations to support local communities. The Board of Education really didn't respond very highly to the demands of the teachers. Margaret Haley's comrade at arms was Catherine Goggin, the softer side to Margaret Haley. So Catherine Goggin said, teachers will never advance themselves until they get over this idea that they cannot think for their own benefit or for their own good. They had no political power. They couldn't vote anyone in or out. So what they had was just the force of saying, we're standing together, we're shoulder to shoulder. Knowing that tenacity will only get them so far, Margaret Haley proposes a radical idea to her 5,000 members, joining the Chicago Federation of Labor. They were very influential, probably half the workforce in Chicago. And so she used that to basically force the Board of Education to uh, give higher wages, better pensions. Improvements in curriculum, improvements in buildings, class sizes, and also sort of a general aura of more respect for teachers. Margaret Haley was a real dynamo and got women elementary school teachers very inspired about the cause. She was also very fiery, quite happy to speak on platforms, many of them where it wasn't even acceptable at the time for women to speak. At NEA meetings, Haley became an irritant to school administrators that controlled the organization. 
Someone says, I hope the Rockefellers and the Carnegie start to support public schools. Well, Margaret Haley stands up from the audience and says, no, that would not be great. Public schools should be public. They should be funded by the public equitably for all people. Margaret Haley always argued that school is not a business. It's not a commercial endeavor. In the early 20th century, textbook companies had a huge control over the curriculum. And she saw the firing of some of her favorite colleagues and district superintendents because they did not buy the textbooks that the school board had ordered them to buy. There was a backlash against the teachers organizing. Many people thought teachers were professionals, they were overwhelmingly women, and they really had no right to be involved in unions. Some unionized teachers were getting pulled out of the classrooms and told that they could no longer teach in the schools. And there was an awareness amongst those few teacher unions that had been formed that there was a need for unification. The American Federation of Teachers is founded in 1916 and it's founded by a number of organizations from a number of different cities. They didn't have collective bargaining. These teacher organizations from across the country saw that to affiliate with labor would give them the power needed to influence through elections or community engagement to get the things they needed. We're all organized around this idea of democracy and education, meaning teachers needed to be part of the organizational development of schools. It's very exciting in the first two years of the AFT. The process of organizing just takes off. In the first few years, AFT grows from eight to 174 locals, but the environment for the Chicago Teachers Federation worsens after just one year. Margaret Haley's influence was seen as upsetting the balance of power in Chicago. Chicago businessman Jacob Loeb is appointed to the Board of Education. He passes the Loeb Rule, which forbids teachers from joining a union. And while the rule is thrown out in court, he fires all Federation leaders with 68 teachers. Including Margaret Haley's sister, Eliza. And it was because of those actions that the Federation withdrew from the Chicago Federation of Labor and then from the American Federation of Teachers. It's tragic that Margaret Haley and her entire cadre of teachers, whose activism really defines the spirit of AFT, felt forced to leave the union so early. But it highlights that there were really no good old days, and the path for member voice and dignity has never been easy. Today, we face many of the same challenges, whether austerity, workplace fairness, or ill-conceived reforms imposed on teachers. Quality public education that is there. As a union, we need to find the feisty Margaret Halleys within all of us to reclaim the promise of public education. Like Margaret Haley a century before, in 2012, Chicago teachers faced a hostile autocratic administration in contract negotiations. The level of disrespect had been so fever pitched that members were very, very angry. Parents were angry. With a recent law designed to make strikes impossible by requiring a 75% member authorization, it came down to a rally at the Chicago Auditorium. And although I'm sure most of the teachers there didn't know this, that was exactly the same building where the Chicago Teachers Union was formed. They can put forth an agenda that has absolutely nothing to do with raising the hopes and desires of our children. But we thought if we could get enough of our members piled into that one place, that we could present our argument for what we had to do, how we had to do it. This is your finest hour! And they were on fire. And over 90% of the teachers voted for strike action. I mean, it's just an unbelievable figure, really. We need to see the kids as human beings and not numbers. That's what the board looks at. They look at numbers, they look at data. They don't put faces behind those numbers and they don't see the issues that we have to deal with. We really are about our children. The only way that anybody's going to understand what they need is if we stand out here and walk the line. We've shown that unions matter and that teachers aren't the enemy and that we need to work together to make schools better for everybody. Teachers united will never be divided.